Cool. Uh, thank you so much. So, um, yeah, we have the exciting uh, topic of payments left for this afternoon. I'm sorry, but it's one of these things that is a, yeah, I know, usually at home, actually, when we have the last panel, I say, you know, look, I'm sorry for standing in the way of you guys in the pub, but we don't really have the pub here. So um, I'm sorry we're standing in front of you guys and dinner, but there is decent beer, so I suppose that's okay. And now I'm starting to sound like an alcoholic Brit. So, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay, let's move on. So, um, payments are very, very important. Um, I've been speaking a lot of, uh, with the W3C people, a lot of people that are involved in standardization, and we all want to make the web better, and that's fantastic. But you know what one of the problems is, is the money needs to come from somewhere. We need the funding to do the cool things that we want to do. So unfortunately, this is just something that we have to go and, and have a chat about. And you know, if you're really into it, then great, because there, there is a lot of money to be made out of that. So cool, um, panel panelists, we've got Manu Smorny. Um, on my left, he sits in the W3C and the IETF, um, doing a lot of work around standardization um, on payments right now, and uh, co-founder, or founder, excuse me, of Digital Bazaar. Um, Ricardo. Ricardo from Telefonica, Ricardo Valera, um, uh, head honcho of the Blue Via, change to mobile work, and did some stuff on WAC before then. Um, Ron Grimshaw, um, managing director of the Financial Times, is sitting to my right here. So... Uh, um, known for FT's pioneering payment models. So cool, we'll have a lot of questions for you. Kumar McMillan, right at the end there, um, from Mozilla, working on a lot of things. I'm sure you do a lot of stuff with MozPay and Firefox Marketplace. Excellent. And Cindy, um, over here, does a lot of work in Google with uh, Google Wallet and uh, the Magic Request Autocomplete, which I'm sure will come up today. So Manu is speaking for us today. So um, I'm I'm driver of the slides. Driver so of the slides. yeah, um, I get all the good jobs. Cool. Uh, so take it away. All right. So um, this panel is kind of titled payments, but I think it's uh, far deeper than that. Um, you know, I, I think when when we think payments, we think you know getting uh, payment from customer to the vendor. We don't think about, uh, for example, 30% of the people in the United States that currently don't have a bank account, that have no way of saving. Uh, in other nations, it's even worse than that. Uh, it's, it can be up to 70% of the population that has no way of uh, saving money, putting money aside for school, for food, things of that nature. So um, while we're talking about web payments, I think that there's a far deeper and more important story here, and that is uh, figuring out a way to get the web uh, to help people that can't save money, that, that don't live in countries where putting money in a bank is a feasible uh, solution for them. Um, so, okay, so, so this isn't just about, you know, paying for products. Well, that's important for all of us. Uh, this is not just a first world problem, it's a problem for uh, people all around the world. Um, so. Uh, as Natasha said, I um, am the W3C uh, uh, chair for the Web Payments Group right now. Uh, I also deal quite a bit with linked data, microformats, microdata, RDFA, uh, JSON-LD, things like that. Uh, and I also deal quite a bit with identity and security, uh, both at the ITF and the W3C. And basically what that means is I get to see a lot of different technologies uh, come by. Uh, these these groups and what we're trying to do is we're trying to pick and choose uh, which technologies will probably be good candidates for integrating into the core of the web's architecture. Until now, we really haven't had a core way of of transferring uh, value around the web, right? I mean, the 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 thing that we look at to to spend money on the web right now or to move money back and forth are things like credit cards and ACH, and that's just not cool anymore. We have to have a better solution. Um, and so I spent a lot of time kind of championing uh, technologies, a lot of the technologies that uh, our panelists uh, are working on currently. Um, so we've, uh, we've got a problem on the web, right? And that's sending and receiving money is typically proprietary. It's very slow. It's insecure. And it is actively hostile to innovation. Right? That's, that's the reason that, that we don't have very many innovative uh, companies in the payment space. Um, you can argue that we do, and I hope that we do get into that argument uh, on this panel. Um, but really, when it comes to uh, making money on the web, many of us make our, our, our jobs are trying to, uh, or our jobs are 
uh, such that we get paid to work on the web, uh, but some people don't have uh, the benefit of working for a large company like Google or Microsoft uh, that can you know, cover their expenses. They would like to have uh, a more direct relationship with their customers. And right now, content monetization on the web is really hard. It's really expensive, especially with the, if you're a merchant. You pay thousands of dollars in fees just for the right to process credit cards. Um, and the reason that is, partially, is because a lot of the payment tech that we use today on the web was invented in the 70s, right? It's the ACH uh, automated clearinghouse system, it's credit cards, all this stuff is really, really old legacy stuff that uh, predates the web by a large degree. Um, so uh, I guess it, it would be good to kind of take a look at some of the use cases that we're trying to address, right? Let's, let's ground this discussion. Um, payment for physical goods uh, today is actually a we do a pretty decent job at it on the web, right? I mean, we've got like things like Google Wallet and PayPal that uh, that you can use to pay for goods. We get the goods. Everyone's kind of happy, right? Um, but when you look at the merchant side of this, um, creating a merchant account to be able to process credit cards is very expensive. There are a lot of fees attached to it. Even even when when you have a really good uh, merchant provider, um, payment provider, it's still kind of it's, a, it's an awful process for, for uh, folks that are kind of mom and pop shops that try to set up uh, on the web. Um, you're usually locked into a payment processor when you pick them. Uh, there's no such thing as data portability, or if there is, like it's really kind of terrible. Um, doing things like in-app payments right now, you're usually tied to uh, a particular app store of some kind, either the, either the iTunes store or the Google Play store, or things like that. And doing things like crowdfunding and crowd loaning on yourself or by yourself, you know, instead of going through Kickstarter, which takes 10% of the money that, that you make. Um, you can't do that, right? And these are these are fun. This is these are things that at least some of us in the web payments group think should be fundamental rights, not just in the U.S. but around the world. You should be able to uh, be in charge of your own uh, financial well-being. Um, so I guess the um, the 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 core here. It, that we're talking about at this panel is, is three different categories of things, three different ways that we spend money on the web, three different ways of raising money. Uh, and the first one uh, is kind of the old money, the popular proprietary category, right? This is most of the payment services that we have right now. And this is absolutely not a slam to any of the, any of the companies that are on this slide. This is, these companies solve a very important problem, which is it really sucks to do transactions over the web, web using your credit card and, and, and ACH. So we've got PayPal, Amazon Payments, Google Wallet, uh, even the new like poster children for like really cool payment startups like Stripe, Square, PayMill, Dwalla, um, and sites like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and CrowdTilt. These are all based on this really horrible old legacy system, right? There are tons and tons of problems that we'll go into uh, during uh, during the discussion today. So that's that's kind of the first category. This is what what's kind of popular uh, right now. The next category is um, online app stores. So these are other types of kind of proprietary silos. They lock you in Apple, the Apple iTunes uh, store, the Apple store, uh, Facebook credits, which used to exist when these slides were made, but doesn't exist anymore. They were just <laughs> shut down a couple of a little while ago, the Windows Store, Google Play, these are all kind of examples of, you know, stores that give really great kind of user experiences, but you're kind of locked into them when you, when you use them, right? There's the, the idea of having this uh, open app marketplace uh, has been talked about, and luckily for us, I think, uh, Mozilla has been doing some really great work in this area of the, uh, making it so that you can sell web apps from any website. You don't have to go through an app store of one kind or another. And so the, the final category, I think, is, is predominantly what I'm really excited about. Right? Th this is what gives me hope. Um, and so th the last bit are uh, these open web payment solutions. Finally, people are starting to work on things that uh, fit very nicely with the web. They don't try and shim the old 1970s, you know, credit card architecture into the web. They are uh, a new way of looking at payments on the web, where payments are instantaneous. There's a lot of rich metadata that goes with it. Um, so Firefox OS is doing a great job with their marketplace stuff. We have PaySwarm, which is the first universal payment standard for the web. Um, Bitcoin. I'm sure many of you have heard of Bitcoin. How many of you have heard of Ripple? Wow. 
I was just at a banking conference like last week, and like half the bankers raised their hands. Um, the, so that's surprising. That like never happens. Um, so so anyway, Ripple was built by like the Bitcoin uh, folks. It's a, it's a kind of a better version of Bitcoin. But these are all really cool technologies that are like native to the web that um, are are really going to sh shake things up. I think they're really going to finally bring kind of payments into the modern age. Um, so uh, I guess the, the goal here, uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to integrate open payment technology into the core architecture of the web, right? We, we did this for communication with email. Email's got protocols. The reason that it's so easy to type in a person's email address and send a message halfway around the world is there's a whole set of protocols around it. No such thing accepts, uh, exists for payments uh, on the web. Um, it's just starting, you know, we've got kind of Bitcoin and Ripple coming along. Um, but we really need to work on it, and that's what we focus on at the Web Payments Group, um, at the at the W3C. Most of the panel members here are uh, part of the Web Payments Group. It's completely open. We really need developers to join. So if you're interested in any of the stuff that you hear on the panel today, please join. Jump uh, jump onto the group and join. If you just Google Web Payments W3C, uh, and if you uh, want to talk about this stuff. Pull me aside and introduce yourself. I love talking about this stuff. Um, so, so please, uh, at the party after this, um, pull me aside if you're interested uh, in any of the stuff that you hear on the panel, as well as the rest of the panelists uh, here. So um, quickly in closing, there's a whole bunch of uh, contact info for you to get in touch if you're interested in payments or interested in actually taking part in this work. Uh, there's a lot of good that you can do here, right? This is world changing stuff. Um, Twitter, G plus handle, email, uh, and the slides are posted up there, paceform.com slash slides. So without further ado, let's get into the discussion. Fantastic. <laughs> So thank you very much for that, Manu. And with that, like you said, we'll kick off with the first question, which comes from um, Ada Edwards. I believe you're reading out this one. Uh, do I have a question? Oh, actually, can we just wait for a mic? Yeah, yeah. thanks. So I have a question from a certain Andrew Betts. <laughs> um, <laughs> topping up a prepay account with a merchant to fund micropayments is free money for the merchant. Why would they kill the golden goose by moving to instant micropayments? So, so I, I can jump in. Yeah, um, go for it. Uh, I, I don't know if I quite uh, agree with the question, meaning, meaning that I think it's, it's short-sighted for any merchant to think of it as any, anybody that's not large. So like Google can think in that way. Google can say, I'm going to require someone to pre-fund pre an account, and then across all the Google properties, you can buy things, right? Your mom and pop uh, web store, someone doing like a niche site, is never going to be able to do that. Or if they're, go if they're going to do that, they're going to lose quite a bit of business. Because uh, I guess Theme Forest is a great example of this. They require you to put in like 5 or $10, what their themes cost $1.24. And you have to kind of be, uh, at least I was when I, when I bought one of the themes off them, I was pretty desperate. I was really looking for a theme. I was under a deadline. I was like, fine, here's 5 bucks. And, and a lot of my money is kind of sitting there still, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm a bit ticked at them. For that, right? I wish I could have just gone to the site, spent a dollar twenty-four, and gone somewhere else. Um, and I think that is the model that we really should be shooting for on the web. You should be able to go to a site, just click a buy button. Don't you don't have to sign up for an account. You don't have to put in your credit card information. You just click buy. The browser takes care of the vast majority of the payment for you, uh, right? It's ease. It's ease of use. And I th and I think micropayments is is kind of a a part of that. You don't want to be charging people like two or three cents at a time, but the idea that you should be able to do a dollar twenty-five transaction, I don't think is uh, is crazy. I think we should be able to do that on the web. Does anybody feel any differently about Ricardo? I was actually going to comment one thing. So first, actually, if I could do a bit of a survey, how many people actually take payments on the web? How many people have a product that actually takes payment? Kind of reduce one. And uh, regarding the Ripple question, how many people know Bitcoin, for example? Everybody, no? OK, it's a good one. <laughs> Good. So the thing that I was going to mention is that one of the problems that we have had with payments, I've been working in payments for like years, and when I got in, I work with mobile operators, which if they're good at something is basically at taking your money, as you probably know. <laughs> so has anybody never received a charge from a mobile operator? The, the bill always gets there, right? So um, I thought that actually we had our, our stuff better sorted out than when I actually got there. And uh, in payments, the main problem is that it's a, it's a domain-specific problem, and it's heavily regulated domain as well. 
So for example, why would somebody want to preload uh, an account and then take your money from there and actually make, make that charge of fees in that transaction? It's because there are different roles in payments. So when actually when a payment occurs, it hasn't really occurred. Mm -hmm. It occurs in different phases. So when you, for example, pay something with a credit card, that money is not yet on the merchant account. That money has got to go from bank to bank normally through a series, if not only one, clearing houses, and then that ends up in the other uh, bank. So basically that means that that bank hasn't actually got paid. There's actually a risk that that money never gets paid, and that is what normally the issuer bank calls bad debt. So when you, for example, prepay uh, an account, what that merchant, that acquirer in that case, is actually trying to do is reduce their bad debt problem. They're trying to say, I've got the funds, so if actually this transaction occurs, I'm going to automatically pay myself. Thank you very much. So that actually occurs whenever two parties in a transaction don't have trust in between them. And this is a concept that I suppose will go back mm. and back again in the panel because payments is all about trust. If I actually email you and tell you, would you lend me 20 bucks? And you actually give me 20 bucks. Uh, that is actually a transaction that has occurred. I've actually, maybe I don't even have my money, but you've promised me that you're going to pay me 20 bucks. Then I get my 20 bucks. At some point I may pay you back or not. You never know. So that is actually an electronic transaction, and that actually happens. So the concept of you paying me, the concept of you establishing my identity via receiving an email from me, which, by the way, is not something that you should trust, probably. SMTP is not the most secure thing in the world. <laughs> uh, those things are what actually happens in payments. And I think we are still don't have a full solution to model all that complexity technically in the web. And that's one of the problems we're trying to deal with. I think I actually owe Andrew Betts 20 bucks, so we'll see if he does or does not get that money. Um, <laughs> so we actually have a panel, uh, a question from the floor. So Alex Sexton, please, oh, there you go, over there, guys. Hello, uh, full disclosure, Stripe employee. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, oh, the, actually, for the floor, would you mind just explaining what Stripe is, just in case? Just. Uh, Stripe is a, uh, a company that, that currently does uh, payments uh, for the web. So I think we were in the first slide. Uh, Awesome. along with uh, many other companies. Uh, so uh, I think uh, me and my friends uh, would all agree that uh, stuff like Ripple and Bitcoin is really cool um, and totally this cool federated way of doing payments. Uh, but, but the bootstrapping uh, of, of that system is, is the blocker, I think, right? So how do you get uh, my parents to be able to deal with Bitcoin. You were talking about, I don't want to sign up for an account. I don't want to do any of this stuff. I just want to hit this button, and money changes hands, and there aren't any of these old systems. So how do you rewire people's brains uh, to make this much more complicated system to them uh, something that, that makes sense uh, at all? I, th I think the the short answer is is ease of use, right? I mean, that's that's that that is the that is the killer app for all of these payment technologies is the b ability to just go to any site, click the buy now button, sh you know, be shown what you're w going to buy, and that's it, right? And it doesn't matter if you're using Google Wallet, it doesn't matter if you're using Stripe or PayPal or anything. They're all speaking a, a fairly similar payments protocol. This is kind of what PaySwarm, the, the, that universal payment standard, is designed to do. The idea here is that you're, you're, uh, you have a common payments protocol that all of the sites use that's open, non-proprietary, W3C standard. Um, and then you can choose, right? You can pick and choose who you, who's going to process your payments for you, if it's going to be your bank, or if it's going to be Google Wallet, or if it's going to be PayPal. Um, and then the merchant can choose whoever they want to. Um, so, so I think the, the way that you bootstrap this mm -hmm. stuff is one through ease of use, and then the, the second thing is you, you, have to, you have to somehow convince vendors that this is worth doing. And I think that's going to be incredibly difficult to do if Google Wallet, Stripe, <laughs> PayPal don't join join onto the work right if they if yeah. they if they continue to do the proprietary we'll stuff. take one more comment from Rob and then we'll yeah. I, I do agree with actually with the point of the the question I, I you know things like Bitcoin etc just they're wonderful ideas um, but you know these things um, only really thrive if they're starting um, from scratch I mean you, you know if you do it in a market like a um, uh, you know somewhere like developing countries like uh, uh, Kenya or whatever, then actually you can make something happen very quickly. So you've got a system like M-Pesa with 17 million users, but most of those people never had a bank account in their lives. So they just accept it as this is this is what it is. For most of the developed markets that we're dealing with, um, on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis as a you know as a merchant like like the FT, um, 
all these people have got their money in existing bank accounts stuck in this 1970s system, um, and it's not going to come out quickly. So for me, the practical solutions are about you know, uh, mitigating that existing system and making it to something which is at least some way practical from a web payments point of view, rather than um, thinking about how we can start again through um, some, some of these ideas, which are wonderful, but to some extent utopian um, <laughs> you know, from the yeah. perspective of, of you know, today's business. J just we quickly, Ripple, Ripple's uh, whole business plan is to get banks we'll get there. To, yeah, That's we'll right. come to Ripple in the, in, the next, um, in the next couple of questions. But interesting to what Rob said, I think one of the next questions is going to make you touch on those utopian viewpoints a little bit. So Teddy Conda, I think, has the next question for us um, here. Thank you. So <clears throat> this question kind of strikes close to home because I worked in publishing and media for a good majority of my career. And I don't know if we'll have an answer to it in this forum because it's uh, a topic that has fundamental problems of its own. However, I'll, I'll add a bit to it as well as read the question. Uh, what payment model is the one that will f will finally make "quote unquote" old media profitable enough online, um, and how soon can we get to that? And furthermore, do you know of any media venues, publishing houses, that are doing this correctly and are actually profitable through uh, through a payment model online? Well, I think Rob, this this kind of hits in. The <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we, we've done it. It's fine. So. <laughs> So explain it to us, Rob. What's it all about? Uh, well, uh, the, the the sort of key thing is actually to be bold enough to charge for your product, um, and uh, uh, actually the, the the world is prepared to pay for for great content, and I think we've established that. Um, uh, quite successfully over the past five years if we've really pursued this policy of um, becoming a, a, a company that generates the majority of its money from content um, rather from advertising. If you look at FT.com's um, finances right now, uh, we generate you know in excess of 70% of our revenues um, from content, i.e. subscriptions, uh, the vast majority of that paid um, digitally um, uh, uh, through our subscriptions. And um, uh, uh, that um, is not an indication that we lost all our advertising revenue. In fact, our advertising grew over the period of time that we um, grew our subscriptions business. It's a sign that actually, if you have the right offering um, and you do work hard on the payment side, you can build a very successful business around quality content online. Uh, fantastic. We've got a couple of questions from the floor. So, um, Ali, if you want to raise your hand. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's kind of off topic now because I wanted to speak actually about the last topic. Is it okay to go back to that or would you rather continue moving forward? I guess what, what I was thinking was um, we mentioned like with the problem with uh, more widespread adoption of Bitcoin being ease of use and I just like I had a gut reaction to disagree with that because I think that a much bigger issue with it, especially among an older crowd, has to do with trust issues and you know feeling that you know they can trust these different sources. And that was just kind of what I wanted to bring up. And you know I'm wondering kind of how you address that and how you make those older people feel more comfortable with these uh, payment options. So can yeah, sorry. please. please. Um, I'm not sure that they'll ever be comfortable with them, honestly. I mean, look at the supermarket. When you're standing at the supermarket, how many older people use debit cards and how many are still writing checks, right? So it might be that that user behavior is so divergent that they won't get there, um, but that doesn't mean that we should, continue, should not continue to push the envelope, right? Like, I do believe that Bitcoin is going to be really challenging. I do believe that from a usability perspective, even when I read up on it and there's big warnings, keep your wallet offline. I was like, whoa, you know, like, and I'm a tech person, right? So the lay person is going to read that one line that's right on the Bitcoin website and they're going to run. They're going to run as fast as they can. So, um, so it's a very, it, this is a social issue as much as it's a payments issue and it's a trust issue. So payments is that complex ecosystem of a lot of different players and trying to make everyone happy is very challenging. We, we, we do live in a period where the price of gold is at an all time high, mm -hmm. mainly because people don't trust 
currencies, full stop, <laughs> um, you know, let alone uh, new ideas like, like Bitcoin. Um, and this, you know, this, this is a, a really difficult, complex issue for societies and economies as a whole, which people have been wrestling with for, for hundreds of years. And, and just kind of introducing something new into that is not something that happens in a, a couple of months or a couple of years. It can take decades, hundreds of years to really establish a new currency properly. Uh, also, sorry. sorry, was going to comment that actually in the payment list recently, we've been actually talking about how this whole payments on the web thing should really be a bit more, we, well, some of us think that this should be more like a two-phase approach. It's essentially there's no open technology to basically do payments on the web at the moment. And there's also the whole built to currency thing, which uh, at some point may arrive. And actually, I think there would be even government initiatives to do this because it, there's lots of benefits about issuing currency that is not physical. But uh, until that moment happens, basically, that doesn't mean that you cannot start with the first part of it, which is the, OK, how about we have open technology to do those payments on the web? Because sometimes, and we have that thing in W3C where we basically go into inventing problems that you cannot really solve, not even in the existing system, imagine on the new system. So we try to first have a system, and then we try to add things like virtual currencies on it. Mm. So this goes into the third question, which came from, um, uh, actually, Manu, I believe this was one of the questions that you originally asked, so I will ask it for you, um, which it actually goes back to the Bitcoin and, and, and Ripple que um, question, which is, do they fit into the plan for web-based payments, and should they be included as payment options, or should they b remain on the periphery? But it seems like what Ricardo is talking about now is they're already being considered as, as being wrapped into the standards. Yeah, and I, I really asked that question because I was more interested in the answer from the panelists, right? And I was I was I wanted to be a bit more pointed with the question: Are there definite plans to integrate alternative currencies into product lines? So like Google Wallet, would Google Wallet ever consider adding Bitcoin or Ripple? Would uh, you know Mozilla? Uh, consider putting a Bitcoin wallet or just some kind of even a USD wallet directly into the browser, so that when you get you know when you download a browser, you've got preloaded ten dollars uh, that you can spend online with it. You go to a website, you click buy now, and the payment's made. It's instantaneous. Right? Yeah, that's actually a quite interesting um, question. So, uh, uh, like um, Manu said at the beginning, lots of us are involved in this in this payment stuff, and and um, Ricardo and I from the operator space, but. Kumar, Mozilla have taken a little bit of a different approach to this where they have said, you know, we don't care who the payment provider is, right? We're just giving you the option to pay, which is a very different stance in, in, in this space. Yeah, I mean, the thing with Bitcoin is you can already pay with Bitcoin on the web. You know, there's already uh, web-based wallets. And so, um, I mean, Mozilla's MozPay API, which I think you're uh, referring to, is just one of the ways you can pay in Firefox OS. It's not the only way. So any 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 app in, in Firefox OS can can take Bitcoin payments. They would just you know need the JavaScript to do it. They would need the online wallet in order to do it. So it would just work. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as far as MozPay, um, a lot of people are interested in incorporating Bitcoin. You know, it's already being asked by a lot of people. They want to see that as a way to buy apps in the marketplace for sure. Excellent. Whether or not it'll happen or not, I don't know. Because <laughs> it's it's it is tough. There's a lot of challenges. And um, while we are at it, actually, so that uh, you get some of the data that we wanted to get, how many people here actually own Bitcoin of any kind? Because I mean, we're like the geekiest of the geeks. Somebody here should have Bitcoin. <laughs> how many people have actually done a transaction with Bitcoin? Okay. And <laughs> how many people, when they bought Bitcoin, actually, when you mean you have Bitcoin, you bought it either in Mt. Gox or uh, one of these, basically, the big exchanges? How many people are Mongox, actually? OK, then you, you use a smaller exchange. Woohoo! OK, this thing's <laughs> working. How many people have lost their wallet and lost over, over 10 to $15? <laughs> There's the problem right there, <laughs> at least with Bitcoin. Cool. Uh, can we throw some questions to the floor? I think Marcus has got a question um, uh, at the front. Uh, this is quite a contentious topic, so if you guys uh, want to vote on the on-slide tool, that'll be great, because it's a, it's a strange one. We don't, we'd like a little bit more developer feedback on, on how people are feeling ab about particular payment methods. So Marcus, please. OK, this one. Sorry. Um, so Manu started the discussion kind of talking about people that don't have or are not in the old system. So they're still using uh, real money, so paper money. Um, so one thing to note is like a lot of people don't want to move to digital money. 
uh, even if they now need to or if they had to because they wanted to buy a uh, service, how would they enter this digital economy? Um, you haven't really touched on that. Mobile devices. M-Pesa is completely mobile-based. Mobile devices are, are basically the way that a lot of people in emerging nations are uh, getting access to the web. And, I mean, they have, they have access to the largest uh, communication network that, the fa that, that mankind has ever known. And if we build a financial protocol into that, that's huge, right? But that on, is a, that's a really big thing. You're treating, you're basically converting telcos into banks. Uh, hopefully, it's going to be telcos and the banks and companies like Google and PayPal. Everyone would have a level playing field to effectively be a financial institution uh, to these people. Okay. Yeah, and so that so that we know, for example, in Europe, there's actually uh, a green paper that has been discussed at the moment by the European Union regarding what is the role of actually telcos regarding the whole payments industry. This is to regulate explicitly digital payments, and one of the things that would have full consequences for telcos if it actually ended up being true because the moment that you regulate it as a financial product, then yep. basically you don't have a, a prepaid phone account. You have a value-added account that telco is storing, which means you could go to a shop and they should refund your money <laughs> and things like that. So it has a lot of implications regarding how do you handle money there, but also it also has a lot of advantages. So what in this, I can actually give one anecdote, which is uh, Bluevia, we do payments for different, uh, basically with the back end that different stores connect to. We do payments with Mozilla, we do payments with Google. And one of the things that happened in Google recently is that in the Android store, uh, WhatsApp, which is this famous IM application, recently decided to charge for subscriptions. Yep. And WhatsApp, only WhatsApp, triplicated our transactions during a period of time in Spain because people who had never entered their credit card in Google Wallet decided to pay with their mobile account because they didn't want to enter the whole credit card thing. They just said, okay, there's an option to actually pay with my phone. That was the first time they saw the option pay with my phone probably because it was the first time that they actually paid. And uh, that thing really launched the transactions up. So actually shows that that percentage of population who probably was the only paid transaction they ever did, yep. they actually used the mobile phone. Okay, so I mean, so the, I mean, the question is, so the larger question is, you know, you mentioned some of the implications. There are tons of legal implications, legal implications around this. Um, you know, how are you guys gonna deal with that, especially in a small community group? Yeah, right now it's actually it's a bit of a gray area because at the moment you, for example, when you charge something to your phone and then it gets into your bill and then your bill gets settled with your bank account, in reality the operator never got hold of that money. That money hasn't never gone to the operator. It actually only settles when the bank pays me from your bank account. So in reality your money has always been in your bank account. It's more like a virtual ledger, what we are holding. You've heard what he said initially about the 70% of the people in the world not having access to a bank account. So this is the, like the thing I'm not getting is that. Yeah, but that's because that 70% of the people, so you take for example a country, this is a country like Spain, where people have got more like contracts, or UK. There's countries like Brazil, or lot, most of Latin America, where actually there's three phone plans, basically there's prepay, there's postpay, the contract that you're used to, and there's mixta, which is where I pay during a period of time. So I say I pay five euros, and I'm like in a contract for a week, that kind of thing. So when you're in those systems, most people are prepay on those markets, by the way, and what they do is that they actually they pay their bill on a shop. They go to a shop, they get a, uh, a coupon, and they load their phone. So that, that's most what they use. OK, um, yeah, complicated like a Las Vegas hotel. So um, we will go on to the next question, which has come up a little bit um, already. But Matt Morgan, if you're around and uh, stick your hand in. Oh, there we go, very easy. Um. Hi. Uh, I think part of this question comes from our host, Andrew Betts. I'm going to personalize it a little. <laughs> uh, the basic question is, what needs to happen to make one-click payment a reality for everyone? What I'd like you to do is think of everyone really broadly and include maybe organizations like libraries and their readers for whom complete conf confidentiality is a requirement. OK. So um, yeah, the, the one-click payment thing is, is quite interesting. And it was one of the things that I was quite blown away with at Google I.O. this year. And Cindy, this is something that you work on, right? Yep. So, I mean, this is a common problem. Users go to hundreds of different forms and fill out the exact same information. So that was kind of the hypothesis between, 
behind Request Autocomplete, which is the new web standard initiative that Chrome is implementing. And part of that initiative, um, I'm fortunate to be able to be part of it because they are integrating Google Wallet as a payment option in addition to Chrome autofill data. But it's that concept that users are filling out the same exact information again and again and again. They don't necessarily want to hand it over to 50 different merchant websites. So why does not the browser as the container hold that information for them and provide it to the different merchant websites on their behalf? So now, Request Autocomplete is obviously dedicated to that true payments use case. It is providing the user's um, information to complete the transaction. So in terms of anonymity, um, I cannot pronounce it. <laughs> in terms of that, it's, um, you know, that, that gets challenging in payments, period. So that's an, an interesting thread that I was surprised hasn't come up sooner, because mm -hmm. that is one of the biggest changes between those 1970s technologies and kind of what is coming out today. Because there are tons of regulations around um, payment companies, and once you're regulated, you have to monitor for, you know, depending on changes country by country, but there's anti-money laundering. There's um, initiatives that governments put in place really for consumer safety that with this anonymous new digital currency, you lose. So that's the definitely the identity th thread is an interesting one. You will not be able to be anonymous when you do a payment online. It is going to be highly, highly, highly unlikely your government will not let that happen. Unless unless you rise up and change it. But uh, if we look at history, that doesn't happen. So actually, I have a, I have a quick question to go over. Um, talking about one-click payment, will, um, is this something that Firefox OS or um, Mozilla are looking at generally? And then what if a user decides to, do the, uh, to opt in to do not track? And then would that then... How does that work? Oh, who? sorry. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, it's fine. I mean, yeah, one tap payments are definitely something that, that uh, you know, uh, MozPay wants to support. Firefox Marketplace wants to support it. Um, that doesn't mean it'll work for everybody. So that's a really harder, much harder problem to solve. Mm. Amazon already does one click, pay one -click payments. I, I mean, it's obviously very possible on the web, it's very easy to do. Um, I think in the short term, request autocomplete is the best way to get there. I think that um, you know that's just the reality of the web right now is that every place you know takes a credit card form and, and you know carrier billing is a little bit more complicated but with credit cards you can have request autocomplete securely store your credit card number and it's two clicks maybe but <laughs> you could uh, just tap the button and say that that yes fill in my credit card and you're done and you know that's going to be a big win for both sides for consumers and for the merchants, because on mobile especially, it's really hard to enter in your credit card. And if you do it once on one site, and if you have to do it, you know, infinite number of times for each other site, that's going to really suck. Right, cool. So, so I, I disagree partially. I, I think you're right in that it is, and you were very specific. You said in the, in the short term, that's probably going to be the best solution. Request out complete, and I totally agree with that. But I think that is. Um, uh, and I don't think anyone on the panel believes this, but I, I think it would be incredibly short-sighted for us to stop there, to say that this is the way it should be for the next five or 10 years. We really need to fix the whole like credit card numbers given to every single merchant you visit on the website or, or on the web uh, issue. Right? I mean, how many people in here would tell your users, I think you should use the exact same password for every single financial account that you have. And whenever you go to a website, whenever you want to spend money, you give them your password. Okay, I'm that's your credit in. card number. I'm going to jump in. And that's where the Google Wallet integration with Request Autocomplete, especially on the Chrome side, does close that hole because we do use the virtual tokens. So we do do protect that user's true credit. But it's proprietary number. to Google, right? It is. OK, we probably should take the <laughs> But we are open to integration with other browser manufacturers. OK, we need to take some, we need to take some questions from the floor. Um, Chene, Chene, you, Chene. So uh, yeah, somebody can pass Chene a, a mic, please. So I guess this, my question kind of relates to the debate that kind of was just going on. But I, we've been talking about responsiveness, uh, legacy clients. And it's great when we move to a world where, yeah, there is an open web standard for payments. But that, right now, it's not that. It's very fragmented. Everyone's trying to push a one, you know, one-click solution to payments. You have, you know, Amazon. You have Stripe. Everyone's putting a button on your page saying, "Pay with me." And so now we're in, in like a dev for developers, we, you know, have our payment form is just now cluttered with "Pay with everything," right? So is there like kind of a strategy for developers 
that in a way that we're not you know cutting into our margins because we're not you know giving the user the payment method they want how do we kind of like balance that is this a web intense can, thing can i just that? In, endorse that comment because uh, i mean you know referring back to the last answer so many of these solutions for for one click payment are essentially proprietary mm -hmm. and when you look at it from a merchant's point of view what it amounts to is this sort of small goods board of different payment solutions that um one by one you have to kind of integrate with your um with your own systems and each one just uh, delivers like a tiny fraction of extra payments um and you know for for a merchant like us which is operating um, across borders. I mean, we have subscribers in 150 countries. Um, this is just a nightmare because uh, many of these solutions only work in one or two or a select number of territories. Um, and it's it's completely impractical. Um, you, you know, we are so far away um, from a one-click solution which will operate seamlessly around the globe for, for, for any merchant, really, at the moment. Um, and that's what that's what we really need to make things work. Yeah, I was going to talk about something around the intense model to be able to say, I just want to pay, and then it's just your chosen payment method comes through. But this is very similar along the lines of what Facebook tried with credits, right? And then they came up against the foreign exchange problem, which anyone who's worked in um, the financial markets will know is just a complete nightmare. Um, so, uh, yeah, any other thoughts on, on this topic? Yeah, so I think uh, Cindy and Kamara are probably never going to talk to me again after this panel. But, um, <laughs> You're but, sitting dangerously close. <laughs> yes, I know, and uh, by the whole too. Um, so I, I, th I think the best thing that web developers can do is put some pressure on Google and, and Mozilla and PayPal and Stripe and tell them that you want some kind of unified payment mechanism that's non-proprietary on the web. I mean, I think that I, I honestly think that that is the best thing for the web right now. And I really, I, in your heart of hearts, I, I think you, you, you agree, right? I mean, we, but we everything, everything, you know, you know what's, <laughs> what I think is really interesting, what's really interesting about that is, is Mozilla and Google are, are uh, browser vendors. Mm -hmm. And I actually don't think that we have a lot of leverage to do this. I think it needs you to come do, from you banks. Do. You I do. I was I was in Dubai at a banking conference with all the major world banks, and they are absolutely terrified of technology companies coming in and stealing their customers. You have so much power to change this. I I, I am I am being ab You have so much power to change this. Okay, let's uh, let's move back to the to the questions from the floor. Uh, Steve, um, I hear if we can get another mic to. Yeah, I guess, I guess it was really just a question about what Manny said that. I, I can't be anonymous on the web. In the physical world, I can go and pay with something in cash and be completely anonymous. Why would I want to give up? I mean, why should I give up that anonymity that I currently have in a physical world? It's a very good question. You, you shouldn't if you don't want to. But I think it's, I mean, you know, we're, we're dealing with... with I mean, you know, there's a lot of information that's collected for, uh, on us on the web. If you don't want that information collected on you, don't get on the web. I mean, you know, we've got we've got issues with Prism, the NSA. We know how easy it is to tap this stuff. It's very easy to track it. Even Bitcoin, which is supposed to be this pseudo anonymous protocol, people have been able to track down, uh, you know, spending habits. Who's who's spending money? So, for example, if someone steals your Bitcoin wallet, uh, that money can't ever be used, really, because if it's used, then and it's and it's uh, uh, tracked down to a shipping address, then they can find you, right? You report your wallet as stolen, and any money coming out of that wallet can be tracked to the person that, that made of any kind of physical purchase. But this brings me back to the whole do not track thing. I'm still really quite interested to know about how this would work with um, a MozPay system um, on okay. Firefox OS, because they're pushing so much for that. Um, I'll wait for the MozPay one. If I can yeah. add only one yeah. thing to this. Sure. The problem, as we were saying before, is basically the whole payments is based on risk and trust. Mm -hmm. And in this case, what you're saying, what you're doing in a financial transaction in cash with somebody is that the issuer, the person who's generating the funds, aka you, is making a transaction with the merchant, which is at the same time the acquirer, this person. And this transaction occurs on something that we both trust, aka government money because we both think that that is actually valuable money. So this transaction has occurred between us. You actually gave away your identity. You gave away your identity to this person who actually can recognize you. And he thought that this was enough to establish trust. So that's why they accepted your money. In the digital world, the problem is that this person is a server down there, and you are a browser somewhere down here. And that trust has got to be established between you two before those funds get changed from your bank to their bank. And that's kind of the problem, is that at that moment, the issuer, that other person, that acquirer, is going to only trust something. And in general, 
like Google will perfectly trust your Google Wallet account. PayPal will perfectly trust your PayPal account. And uh, Mozilla will trust whichever account you actually have got to be configured in MozPay. But uh, Google won't accept your PayPal identity as being a valid identity. That is where the problem comes. Because they don't establish trust based on the other identity. Uh, excellent. We probably should actually um, move forward. So Tom C, if you've, oh, OK, good. There we go. Um. Thanks. I think if we, if I can distinguish between anonymity and confidentiality, somebody's coming to the library to pay a 25 cent fine for an overdue book, and we don't want anybody to know. We know who that person is because we know you checked out the book, but I don't want anybody else to know that you paid a fine on it. Is there a way I can do that online for 25 cents? No. No. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, not yet. I, I, well, I, th I think there is, right? If you use Bitcoin to do it, um, and it's uh, and you create a one-off wallet, you could do that payment. But I mean, that's really it's it's very difficult to do that. Technically possible, not very feasible. Which I, th I think is the ans is is the answer they were giving. It's not very, uh, it's not a good user experience. So Kumar, oh sorry, Rob, you go ahead. I, I, some of the stuff is not about the technology either. I think governments are, around the globe are attacking anim anonymity in the financial system on all fronts for issues of taxation, money laundering, etc. Um, and I, I don't think that effort is is going to stop. And as we you know as we move into an electronics payments world, um, I, I don't think they're going to allow big channels of anonymous payments, whether it's technically possible or not. Cool. All right, we should move on now. Um, I'm liking <laughs> what people are managing to get on the, who we have money bags and Scrooge McDuck. This is, is going, this the this end is of the day, well. humor. Um, am I Scrooge McDuck? Brilliant, um, that's fantastic. Uh, let's see what things. I kind of wish that was the case, unfortunately not. So Matt Andrews, uh, if you stick up your hand for the next question, please. This is another anonymous question. I think it's probably been done to death, but here we go. Um, what are the possibilities for decentralized peer-to-peer -peer payments, and what security considerations are involved in doing this? So decentralized peer-to-peer -peer payments, and what security considerations are involved in doing this? Going back to a similar thing, Kumar, do you want to start us off on this? Sure. I think, well, I've been sort of in the realm of Firefox OS, which is a mobile operating system, and it's really hard on mobile devices to do uh, something to get to a decentralized place like that, um, we would need like a, the web crypto API to land so that we can make sure that things are, are, are very secure and, and even in memory are secure. Um, and there's there's some, AP, um, and another API which is coming is to access a secure element on, on certain SIM cards where you can actually do uh, um, sort of public key exchange type of things. All those technologies are needed but at the end of the day, you could still uh, root a device, you know, if you if you were to steal it, and then you could get access to a lot of things. So I, I think it, I think we're pretty far off. From, but I think there's that's what would need to happen. It would have to be something that's, you know, it would have to be this bulletproof device because you know also if it's completely decentralized, that means that you're paying with a device, and let's say it's Bitcoin or something. And it's not backed up on a server because it's decentralized. Um, you might lose that dev device, and then you lose all your money. And maybe there's some way to distribute that across many nodes. I don't know, but yeah, hard problem. Uh, sort of against the cloud pattern that seems to be happening with lots of things, I guess. Any other um, points on that? Um, well, I mean, you you can you can already there are already decentralized peer-to-peer -peer payment systems on the web, right? Bitcoin and Ripple, Ripple are two of them. You can use them. They're, they're online wallets, so you have to be able to get to some website to run the transaction. But the protocols work, right? I mean, the Bitcoin's been under attack since it ever came out and, and by really smart people in, in crypto um, and security uh, areas, and no one's really broken uh, the protocol. So I think they're they're here. It's just the idea of it being integrated directly into the browser is is probably I I, I would expect that it would never happen, right? Uh, or at least not for the next ten to fifteen years. Because the risk you run when you uh, put it into a browser is you have to end up supporting it forever. And I don't think any of the browser and I don't think it would be smart for any of the browser vendors to build that technology in right now. Which is why you know the Firefox Marketplace and and Telefonica are 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 taking the approach they are on these. Uh, APIs. They're trying to be very generic and not trying to be kingmakers when it when it comes to um, uh, payment technologies. 
Okay. It's the right way to do it. Fantastic. Uh, let's take another question. So, um, Adam Sontag, if you're in the room, we put up. I think he's over there. <laughs> So this is an anonymous question that at the request of Jake Archibald, I have mildly reformatted into rhyming verse. So <laughs> one question that still needs distilling is, what's the feasibility of operator billing? And given that cell phone, pref phones prefer Wi-Fi to sell, will I have to forget this network to buy and sell? <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Very impressive, cool. by the way. So uh, my, my skill is not enough to actually answer you in bursts, I'm afraid. <laughs> but uh, definitely, I mean, operator billing is something that is widely used now. We are also in the middle of, for people who are not familiar with, in the middle of a change of technology. So we went from premium SMS, which is essentially I charging you for an SMS message, very clunky, had lots of messages, a really high revenue share for the operator because it was a really old technology, it used to sell ringtones and things like that. So not as good to direct operator billing, which is essentially you make a call to an API, which is more 20 for hello for 21st century, and uh, basically you send me an amount and a phone number, and the phone number acts as basically the user account. That is working now. It's actually you can pay with that in Google, you can pay in RIM, in Nokia, in Bluebia, work with, we work with at least 20 something different providers, they, including Mozilla, and basically that is what modern operator billing is about. The problem that I see in modern operator billing is that modern operator billing was operator billing was thought to be something that you negotiate with an operator. So you negotiate with O2, then you go and negotiate with Vodafone, then you go and negotiate with Telefonica. And the problem there is that you have to close one account for each of these things. So one of the things that we actually try to solve with Bluebia is to give to the Telefonica group just one connection for all those billings. So do what Visa does in the case of banks, where you're, you basically take Visa payments, right? You don't take Lloyd's, NatWest, Barclays, and whatnot, don't know what payments. You take payments from a network. So I think that is the step that we have missing, but actually you can do charges to a phone number now. Like with so modern the, technology. One of the problems is, though, is this, this issue of being over Wi-Fi is that you can't, an operator cannot n recognize you as a user if you're, if you're on a Wi-Fi network, correct? You only need to know what's the phone number of the user, and that can happen in a one-time transaction, which is, for example, how Google does it, is how Mozilla does okay. it. Basically, if you are, operators have multiple ways of recognizing what phone number you're in. For a start, you're connected to a base station, so we, if you are giving you service, we know your number. So if, there's, if you're connected to the normal network, you can identify the user through the network. If they're connected in Wi-Fi, then you do a fallback to SMS, which normally is either you send an SMS to the device with a code, or you make the, S the device send you an SMS, and then you receive it. In both cases, you establish what is the number of the user, and then you can just use that again and again. We have a specific API built for this in Bluevia. In other operators, you have to do it more manually, but you can do that. And to be clear, you can do it again and again because it just stores a cookie on device. I mean, the cookie lasts 30 days or something like that. And when you're on Wi-Fi, it reads the cookie so it knows that you're authenticated. OK. So um, <laughs> fantastic. Um, so can, can I be Montgomery Burns, please, this time? Yeah, awesome. Um, it's, it's getting better. Right. Um, we only have five minutes left, so I'd kind of want to close on a. Uh, we have a room of technologists here, and and I'd like to I'd like to focus on a little bit of the standards, a little bit of the what we can do. So if we just go around and have a little bit of a chat, um, or, well, if you could all say, give one minute on what we could do as developers to push to the ideal payment solution. And uh, Kumar, I'm afraid I'm going to start with you. Sure, um, as developers. Or standardizers. <laughs> yeah, that's a tricky one. I, I do think, as I mentioned before, I think to really have a sort of federated payment system where anyone can pay with any currency um, and any merchant can accept money from anywhere, I think something needs to come. Some API needs to be agreed upon and implemented by banks or something, maybe a clearinghouse in front of banks. And I don't think that browser vendors can do that. So I have strayed from the topic of what developers can do. I still don't know what developers <laughs> can do. <laughs> so. Ricardo? 
Well, I think that uh, for a start, we have to have more realistic expectations, I think, in all of this. I think there's, uh, judging from the work that we did in WAC, where you try to do a mobile billing, in this case, for 40-something operators across the globe, and this includes Asia and Africa and Latin America, there's no way you can sync all of those things. It's too big a problem. However, you can start in a smaller area. So you take something like the European Union. The European Union is about to standardize on a series of measures called SEPA. You could do, in theory, some hub for the European Union with a specific protocol that works across all the providers in the European Union. Obviously, it won't work in Latin America, it won't work in China, but it's something. So we start trying to standardize there, and we try to push for a standard API or a standard way that different providers can implement that there, which is how it normally happens. Banks didn't go and try to standardize on this SEPA thing worldwide. They standardize in the European Union more or less, and then let's see how it extends. Or you do two networks, and then we talk a common protocol among our networks. That would be fine. The thing is that you need those initial solutions to be there. So request auto complete or must pay are initial tries of getting to that standard API. Just use them, feedback to them into saying I'm lacking these things. So request auto complete doesn't support carry billing, must pay. We're going to do another iteration now. Whichever thing that we have, just feedback to that and start with that smaller goal before we get to the bigger goal. Um, I'm actually very excited about some of the things that Ricardo is talking about. Uh, I believe fundamentally that the solutions are going to be mobile based. Ultimately, you know, there are all, we're almost at the point where there are mo more mobile devices than people um, on the planet. Uh, there are far more people with mobiles than there are with bank accounts, for example. Um, and if some of the things that Ricardo um, is talking about, i.e. the development of a, a network and uh, uh, a sort of global standard network for payments across ma major mobile operators can develop, then I can see how a merchant like us um, can take payments on mobile devices potentially from a, a marketplace of billions of people around the globe. And that's very, very exciting. Um, and if you think about it, what you've got there is a, a chain. Um, all these devices in some way are linked up to a source of value, whether that's a bank account or whether that's a prepay or whatever, the, the chain of value is already there. If you can create the, 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 the standard across the top of it, maybe starting in the EU or the US or whatever, um, which then a merchant like us can then hook into, that can deliver the solution. Um, and I don't think you have to think about utopian scenarios mm. in order to get there. It's, it's not difficult to see how this, this step can be taken. Yeah, so um, from um, my point of view, I think that's an important issue. Lots of people, lots of users think about what would be great for the users, and, and I think the way that you're going to get the thing that you want as a user is to influence from a merchant standpoint or from the bank standpoint or from the standardization standpoint. And that's my takeaway is that, okay, if you want your user goals, you go for it, but you put a slant on it and sell it up to those other people that m makes them think that they're getting something when you're actually getting something, and that's the way to get what you want. Um, so with the hard life style tips. Um, Manu, go for it. Uh, so anybody in here that's interested in payments, the thing that you could do is join the web payments group, join the discussion. It's completely open. Anyone can join uh, and, and participate. Educate yourself about it and help us actually figure out what standards to build, right? What to build that, that, that you, can, you can use. The, the other point I wanted to kind of make is uh, playing off of Kumar's you know, bank-based bank uh, thing. I did spend the last week at the World Banking Conference in Dubai. Um, no bank is working on this. I guarantee you. I, I had high level, high level, low level, all kinds of discussions with them. Um, the standard bank system is written in COBOL or Fortran. It was implemented in 1987 not to, through 1992. They're still running that code base. They are absolutely mortified of doing any kind of large change to their system. So. This solution is not going to come from the banks. It could come from the mobile operators. Uh, it could come from um, uh, uh, the, the uh, people like Google Wallet, PayPal, Stripe. Um, but at some point, all of us are going to have to band together in some kind of clump and push something forward. It's definitely not going to be the banks that do that, though. All right, so throw yourself into the standardization. And finally, Cindy. Real quick, because I know everyone's ready to be done. So um, no, just really use MosPay, use Request Autocomplete. Even though it is technology from the 70s, it is what everyone is still using. And there's plenty of room to improve that 70s technology experience on the web as we try and lay a foundation and segue into more you know, different technologies. But definitely, Request Autocomplete, MosPay, participate. We are trying to make it better. 
Okay, excellent. So that's us done. Thank you so much to the panelists and uh, yeah, good night.